we're going to be a lot less formal tonight. Uh, my name is Russell Barge. Uh, I'm one of the uh, uh, organizers of this, uh, representing New York University and the School of Law. My co-chair, Roberto, is representing the NGO committee for the decade of the world's indigenous people. So this is a university NGO collaboration to do something useful and informative in connection with the current big show in town, the first session of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. What we hope to do tonight is uh, get some different points of view from Indigenous people and UN officials. Very lucky to have a number of people very deeply involved in these issues with us tonight. And to do it in a, in a way that there'll be time not only to chat, maybe some questions and answers back and forth uh, between the folks up here and, and all of you folks who come to join us, but also time to enjoy the refreshments and mix and meet each other and uh, just enjoy uh, some informal talk as well. So we are not going to uh, keep you in your seats all night, but uh, introduce ourselves with different talks and different points of view, and you may want to meet some of us and have a chat over uh, drinks and uh, refreshments later on. What I'd like to do, uh, in addition to uh, introducing uh, my, uh, my colleague and friend, Roberto Guerrero, is to introduce uh, Mar Marguerite Smith, who is a very important representative on this panel because she is from one of the indigenous nations that has managed to survive in the <coughs> New York area and has been able to maintain its identity and its core traditions despite being engulfed by this enormous city and enormous um, cosmopolitan New Yorkness that all of you are either part of or have uh, now visited. I'm very, very pleased to be able to uh, have Marguerite here to welcome you uh, for the people of this area, the original people of this area. And without any further ado, Marguerite, if I may call on you with great respect to open this session, Marguerite Smith of the Shinnecock Nation. territory just under 100 miles east of Kennedy Airport on the South Shore. So as you saw the Atlantic Ocean, we would travel there. We say Shinnecock. There's one community in Canada that speaks a language very close to what we believe to have been ours. We barely speak our language. We say a word or two. We work on cultural <clears throat> preservation and language revitalization. But we know we are doing it not with having lived through, at least I have not lived through, the last language speaker. The last language speaker in my community, the person who really spoke, who conversed, died 10 years before I was born. The loss of language. I heard people yesterday speak of the loss of language. And the importance of language to knowing how to do our ways. Knowing how to be in kinship with one another and with all of creation. That's lost to us. So much, the nuances are, are probably lost to us. We'll work hard. And we will adapt, as indigenous people have always adapted, which is why any of us are still here. We've had to adapt to isolation, or we've had to adapt to cultural onslaught. My people are in what most of you know if you've picked up any of the travel logs as the Hamptons. Glamorous, glorious, beautiful beaches. Guess what? Some small communities of people still living together, 
Still remembering how to give thanks together? Still remembering how to go to the waters together? Or alone, as you must, also? Seeking to live together on a very small parcel of land. Seeking to tell the rest of the world what are the sacred sites that are sacred to us and must be sacred to them if they truly believe in religious freedom. Sacred to them necessarily, but certainly worthy of their respect and their legal recognition. <coughs> Those are some of the concerns. Preserve cultural ways, preserve sacred sites, tell others about the sites that they sit upon, reclaim those sites, reclaim that heritage, give it to the children, that they may be strong again, they. they may regain pride, and give it to the world, because the world has troubles, and the indigenous peoples know about balance, know about peacemaking, and the voices must be heard. Wish you a good Congress. Very special opening speaker. Roberto. Bonatum Natiao, say gracias, mi hermano. Thank you, my brother. Uh, trilingual. Uh, hello. <laughs> And um, I want to welcome you all here also and thank you, uh, Margaret Nitoul, uh, sister, for that wonderful welcoming and uh, for making us feel this way in this land. And you know that all, all the Algonquin speakers who were here in this area uh, would appreciate that very much. Myself, uh, as was said, my name is Roberto Mucaro Bojero and uh, current chairperson of the NGO Committee on the International Decade of the World's Indigenous Peoples. And we're very, very happy to be part of this uh, event, the organizing body of this event. And a uh, very special, uh, right, right in the beginning, this very special thanks to uh, the main proponent or who pushed this event along uh, feverishly, um, our sister Marie Samuel there. So I just wanted to thank you. situation, uh, whether you're an indigenous person or uh, not an indigenous person, how you identify yourself. And I think that's basically when we talk about uh, cultural heritage and this uh, issue that we're going to be speaking about tonight and we get a little bit deeper into uh, the idea of sacred sites, that idea of respect and how people interpret that term, that word, is really at the heart of a lot of things. I know in our language, our ancestral language of my of my people, Taino people, um, we say Bahari. It's, it's a terminology that's just far beyond just one word of respect, but very wide reaching. And the way we look at uh, the earth, the world, our ancestors, our relations, our relatives, all of us here, has to do with that concept. So with that in mind, I'm very happy that all of our relations are here. And I'd like to introduce our first speaker uh, for the evening. Please welcome Dr. John Yazzie. Traditionalist 
environment of Uganda are the best known and most assertive kingdom in Uganda, who received all my uh, primary education in traditional schools dispensed in my mother tongue, Uganda, which did not prevent me from going on to learning English, Swahili, French, and Spanish later on. Would not prevent me either to go to university because I started off my mother language and to continue taking great interest in my own culture, even at university at Montreal in Uganda, where I majored in education and history later on, which is entrusted to the mandate of culture. I can attest to the value of being grounded in two and taking pride in one's indigenous culture. Therefore, I greatly appreciate the thanks, the opportunity given to me by the organizers of this meeting. At the same time, with the declaration of 2002 at the United Nations Year for Cultural Heritage, UNESCO and the United Nations community wanted to celebrate the 30 years since the 1972 convention on cultural heritage, which is celebrated as the most popular convention signed by 167 state parties and hosting a list of over 720 sites. And my colleague who has just come from Paris tells me that there is a list of about 1,500 sites waiting to be enrolled on, the list, on that list. Therefore, it's a growing growing interest which is manifested here. And those sites so far spread over 124 countries in the world. Naturally, when the 1,500 uh, sites enrolled, the number would grow up to 170, 180 member states uh, signing up on the list. Finally, for UNESCO, which cherishes international cooperation and understanding. The Year for Cultural Heritage celebrates the partnerships which have been weaved for advocacy and action towards the protection of cultural heritage, especially of indigenous heritage and respect for cultural diversity, as well as the promotion of a healthier dialogue among civilizations as great advantages for peace and development, and in fact, trying to encourage action regarding indigenous peoples and other cultures and diversity, definitely UNESCO is playing its principal role of constructing the culture, the culture of peace in the minds of men and of women. I thank you very much. Implementation Unit of the World Heritage Center at UNESCO headquarters in Paris. has been designated the UN Year for Cultural Heritage, 
It's also the 30th anniversary of the World Heritage Convention, which is the subject of my particular work. And as you know, the first permanent forum on Indigenous issues is taking place um, down the road at, at UN headquarters. Um, now UNESCO, as Mr Kiazza mentioned, plays a particularly significant role in the protection of cultural heritage. And UNESCO has a number of conventions and recommendations, as he mentioned, on the protection of this heritage. Um, UNESCO also has a rather significant program on what's called Man in the Biosphere, that promote, promotes sustainable use of a network of biospheres around the, the world, um, in cooperation with local communities. Um, most recently, in 2001, just last year, there was also uh, the adoption of a new convention for the protection of underwater cultural heritage, the new Universal Declaration on Cultural Diversity, and the work is now beginning um, at quite a pace to determine what is the best international system of legal protection for the intangible cultural heritage, including traditional dance and song and so on. Now these new um, initiatives include issues of heritage protection that are very likely to be of particular interest to Indigenous peoples. Um, I can't speak about all of these initiatives. And as Russell mentioned, my particular specialty is on the implementation of the World Heritage Convention, which was adopted 30 years ago. Now, the World Heritage Convention is what we call a standard setting instrument. Um, it uh, recommends international cooperation in the field of heritage conservation. And as you've just heard, it um, has 167 uh, states parties that have signed up to this convention. It calls on signatory states to identify, protect, conserve, present, and transmit to future generations in the words of the convention itself, the outstanding cultural and natural heritage situated on the territory of those states. This is a significant point that it is a very unique instrument in that it protects both cultural and natural heritage, and perhaps this is also why it has such tremendous relevance to Indigenous communities around the world. The Convention doesn't actually include specific reference to Indigenous peoples or to the importance of heritage sites to Indigenous peoples. However, the Convention does include reference to links between people and the environment, and it refers specifically to the combined works of nature and of man in the language of 1972 as part of the common heritage of humankind deserving of protection. So that's what the convention says. Um, that's all I wanted to say now. I've tried to bring them up to date with um, what are the latest developments in this very particular area of UNESCO's work and how it relates to Indigenous peoples. I'm very happy to um, talk to any of you after the meeting or to take questions if there's time. And I will be here until around about lunchtime tomorrow um, at, at the meeting in, in the UN headquarters. Again, thank you very much for, for coming and for your interest. Um, thank you. Uh, I'll bring things over to you to, to get the final word. Thank you very much, Bomatun, and Bomatun, all the panelists here. Um, Bomatun, with our relations, all my relations here. Um, there's so many things that come to mind, but as uh, already stated, we have such a short time left. I would just like to um, leave you with this idea. I just traveled back uh, to my own homeland of uh, Boruking, uh, which translates to the Great Spirit Land. And uh, people know that today as Puerto Rico, or the rich port, as uh, other people have called it. And when we were having meetings about this subject, we have a similar situation to what read where the idea of federal recognition, and we have a double colonized atmosphere because we have uh, the local government itself who is uh, oppressive of our local community. And then we also have the United States regime that also controls any national legislation over the island. So we have to go uh, through many steps to even get heard at all. And in that, even in that concept, we don't exist at all. Um, but we did meet and speak about many things. And I thought uh, what was interesting uh, and probably important to highlight here is the idea of the similarity of situations. And um, some of the things that um, our people had said uh, to me to, uh, to relate to you, we've put together uh, very briefly in uh, two pages that come out in this uh, package that was so beautifully put together by the organizers. 
And um, I would urge and uh, ask you uh, humbly if you could just take a look at some of the things at some point when you go home or some time during the week or whenever, uh, to take a look at some of the recommendations that our community felt was important to stress as far as our relationship uh, to UNESCO and also what, what we as indigenous peoples can do for each other um, and the idea of responsibility and the idea of community, but not only our own little community in our island, but in our expansive community, as uh, my dear sister in the back, Christine, can attest, our communities in the Caribbean in particular, um, Christine comes from the Guyanese Organization of Indigenous Peoples, um, also part of my ancestral relationship through our Arawak language groups that archaeologists and anthropologists have termed, although we have our own names for ourselves, our community says Lokono, my community says Taino, but we're uh, called Arawak language speaking groups by others. But that's how we also acknowledge our, our long distance relationships over our, our from time beginning relationships, you know. And uh, one of the things that we can do just to support each other, I and mean, we've started uh, international uh, petitions where we put these petitions online and we ask people to support because just recently, because of these just simple initiatives, asking other indigenous peoples to come to meet us on our homeland, to go see some of the abuses of our ancestors, of our, of our remains in these museums that we can't really access uh, locally, but by getting other people to come to our homeland, uh, one museum in particular in the uh, town of Hayuya, which is the name of uh, one of our chiefs uh, from the contact period, um, we, we brought this up with the Native American Youth Museum of Canada who came to visit us. And um, we urged the museum to take these considerations uh, into, into their own mindset, into their own policy. And although they have not given us back the remains, they've agreed to cover the remains so that not for public viewing anymore because we felt that that was just a, a, a real disgrace to have our ancestors' bones just open up in the glass case beforehand. But because of the uh, participation of our indigenous uh, relatives and other people who have come on board to help support us, this little act of, of, of covering our, our sister who's there uh, took place. And this was a local initiative. So I, 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 what I'm trying to say is that just us working together and supporting each other in a very simple way can have a very profound effect because from that now, other people within the larger Puerto Rican community, and it's not to say that everybody in Puerto Rico is Taino or an indigenous ancestry, but the larger the Puerto Rican community has now begun to look at this issue for the first time, and we've actually now begun to have dialogue with the government where we haven't had that before in many years as Native people with support from the larger community. So that was one thing uh, I wanted to stress that we, as indigenous peoples and as supporters, can help each other in that side. Um, in particular, there was one thing that we wanted to stress for UNESCO was our Caguana ceremonial site, which is one of the largest uh, ceremonial centers in the Caribbean, where, again, this idea of coming together was from time immemorial, because there the archaeologists have already stated that this has already shown so many different uh, indigenous groups coming to meet there from well, well before any written record, a Western written record although we have pictographs and all of this to attest to that. So I think the idea of partnership is, is, is we've tried to uh, stressing from the beginning of this uh, permanent forum, uh, the idea of building new relationships and taking our responsibility as human beings to support each other. And I'm very excited about this uh, group right here of um, UN agencies being here with local people and that we try to get this kind of initiative going at many levels. Like if we can have these kind of meetings, maybe in Guyana one year, maybe out in New Mexico, and try to keep bringing this issue, I think that'll keep moving the momentum for our people to come together. If we keep seeing how our issues are related, we can support each other, and that will also add momentum. So with that, uh, I say Oma Bahari, with respect to all of you, I thank you for giving me that opportunity to share just a little bit. And uh, would again ask you to help me look at our statement as well in the overall context of how we can support each other. And Bomatu, gracias, thank you for uh, this time. And thank you again for the organizers for coming up with this idea, this initiative. Yeah. Thank you all. Before Willie leaves, we know that we're going to be.
handing all these uh, case studies over to the permit of four members as a gift for you. So I just wanted to say that before you left. Thank you so much for coming with us. Yeah, okay.